Good Saturday morning to everybody and welcome to Mortgage Matters Radio Show along with Rob Weinberg. I'm Gary Byron. Rob, how are you this morning? All right, Gary. How you doing today? Always good to be in person with you. It's, all, it's, it's actually one of my favorite days when you get to come in, in oh, person yeah. too. I know I sound like crap, um, but I don't feel at nearly as bad as how I sound. So... Hey, good enough for me. My voice. Yeah, I may end up losing my voice, but you know what? I think you can, if that were to happen, you can carry I'll me. carry the show this time, but <laughs> I got it. I got it. How was uh, How was your Thanksgiving? Hey, always good to see family. Yeah. Take a little bit of time off. Relax a little bit. Get he- away from the office. Were you here in Connecticut? Nope. New Jersey. New Jersey. Huh? Yep. That's yep. where your wife's family's from? You got it. Yep. Yeah. They're nearby. Mine are down in Florida, so not as easy to make the uh, commute. How often do you see your family in Florida? Oh, they come up all the time. Oh, do they? Now. Okay. Yeah, since my dad retired about, I guess about a year ago he retired, somewhere around there. They come up, I'd say, three, four times a year, maybe more. That often? My brother's up in Boston. His son is... uh one and a half now, I believe. How often do you go down there to visit them? Uh, I'd say once a year, maybe twice. Like winter time, more so. Yeah. So back before, I mean, even back before I got married, I was living in Connecticut. I used to go down back down to Florida early December. I'd head down there around December tenth, eleventh. I'd be able to get a dirt cheap flight around then, like. Literally less than $200 round trip flights. Mm. But anyways, I'd get down there and I'd just stay from about December 10th through the end of the month. And I'd come back, you know, early January when the flights, again, were cheap. I'd, I'm not coming back New Year's Day or, you know, there's certain days right. that are high travel days around the holidays, right? You stay away from those. So it'd be like around a month because I'd go up or, or go down, I should say early December and I'd come back early January. Next thing you know, I'm 30, you know, almost a month down in Florida in the the middle of winter in Connecticut. It was very very oh, that nice. Is, that is and nice. I'd stay with my parents, so I didn't have to worry about any of that, you know, hotels or any of that other stuff. So, it was really a nice vacation for me, and I did that up until I got married. Even when I got married, I went down a, a year, couple years with my wife to do the same thing, but it's harder now. Going back to Thanksgiving, I mean, it, are you the when you go to your in-laws and spend the day with them, you, other than eating the big meal, of course, are you a football family or do you guys toss the ball outside? Do you play games? Do you play, play games. Okay. Not a, they're definitely not into. I mean, I shouldn't say that. We'll have a game on the TV. Yeah, you know, on the back. But the are we actually like in every play? You know, looking at every single thing going on, not really. It's more just background, like you said. Got the kids gathered around playing games, sure. you telling stories, maybe a glass of wine or a cocktail, hey. right? Nothing wrong with that. So, um, you know, it's, the, it's one of the few days of the year where you can literally step back and have nothing going on with work. Because, you know, in real estate and mortgage, it's a 365-day type of industry. It really is. But Thanksgiving will be the one day I'll say I really don't get calls. You know, I don't get a lot of emails and texts from clients. And if it is, it's more along the lines of, hey, I need to talk to you about something. But, you know, let's discuss tomorrow or what's your availability tomorrow. Yeah. I find that Black Friday is always a pretty big day for for business because it gets pent up, you know? People don't stop buying homes or getting mortgages just because of Thanksgiving. So those needs come through. And a lot of times people discuss with family, right, what's going on, and they'll find out, hey, yeah, we can give you that gift that you needed to buy a home. So there'll be some action, you know, right before uh, we get into December, end of end of November, because – you know, you have that collaboration with the family. Maybe find out Uncle Joe can give you that gift that you didn't know or that you had. That hoped brings for. me, you know, you bring up a good point. Like, no one's having an open house on Thanksgiving right. and no one's going to go look at homes on Thanksgiving. Right. It's not a religious holiday. Therefore, it's really something that's really everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Are there any days out of the year, though, when. Like you wouldn't expect Christmas. Not everybody celebrates Christmas, but look, for all intents and purposes, it's a pretty right. It's not right. a busy day. That's okay, for I mean sure. even I mean even restaurants, except Chinese restaurants, they're always open. Are there any surprises that you received over the years? Where oh my goodness, I can't believe I got a 
text message or a phone call or an email from someone today? Like, you ever get, do you ever get a, a message mean, on Christmas or, or Thanksgiving or in the past? The messages are just more happy Thanksgiving, oh, okay. ha- Merry Christmas, happy holidays. That's fine. Like I said, occasionally we'll have deals in process and get an email from a realtor or a buyer that's like, hey, I have a question about this or I need to talk to you about that. But it's it's more setting up a conversation for the next day. There's nothing pressing going on Thanksgiving because there's no closings going on. you know. But like I said, it is a time for family and family is a big part of the home buying and, and the mortgage process, right? So I do see sometimes opportunities unlocked on Thanksgiving because of that collaboration where, again, you can say last year we talked about it or I told you I was looking to buy a home. Now I'm in it. Now I'm pre-approved or I'm getting pre-approved. And you get to talk about finances. It's one of the few times a year where families can candidly sit down and really talk, talk turkey. You know, that's the truth, especially when it comes to money and finance. So I, I've seen some good things come out of it, and that can't be uh, put aside to utilize the Thanksgiving holiday. Sure, right? sure. So, of course, there's mistakes people make that happen, whether it's Thanksgiving or any time of year when it comes to buying the home and getting the mortgage. And that's also – I think some of the mistakes people make, Gary, come from getting information from people that maybe shouldn't be giving advice, right? What do you think are some of the most common – we like let's say mortgage mistakes that you see homeowners mortgage mistakes yeah yeah what are making today we see the same ones all the time i mean right now i think more than ever we're seeing people not having a strategy for their mortgage at all and we talked about this a lot when the rates were lower because we saw them kind of stair step down for years so it was all about how does the mortgage play in but now with the rates going up so quickly people are just like They're like a deer in headlights, right? So they're not thinking about what does the mortgage look like three years from now or five years from now. I would say today's home buyer more than ever, I'm seeing with a very short-sighted mentality, just looking at it as this is my mortgage for life, okay? Mm -hmm. And don't have that strategy. Don't have someone to guide them to say, hey, this is just one step on your long-term strategy. So that's the biggest mistake I think I see right now. Number two is going to be when it comes to sourcing their mortgage, where are you getting your mortgage? There's still so many consumers out there that think that the only place to get the loan is either their credit union or their bank. Those are the two that I see people gravitate towards. I think a lot of it has to do with the relationship. When we're young, our parents have us set up a bank account with a local institution, right? And a lot of people, when they turn 18, that might they may have had that same bank account for their whole life, right, right? since they were younger. So there's a lot of built-in brand equity and trust there. Sure. But something we've talked about on the show, and I really try to portray to people, especially today in 2023 and beyond, is that... The bank and the credit union are right now, they're definitely not the best place to get your mortgage. And, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I think they were there was very limited options for places to get a mortgage. You had to deal with a local bank or a credit union or that local financial institution. But, you know, mortgage brokers came about. Now there's correspondent lending. There's other places to look and people they only deal with that. They don't know about the other options. They don't look at the other options. They don't realize the advantages, right, of those other options. And then the last one, and this is one, again, I'm seeing so so often now, is only looking or evaluating the mortgage you're getting only based on the rate. So they're not looking at what are the closing costs. They're not looking at what is the down payment, you know, all these factors that play in and just saying, oh, that rate's seven, that rate's eight, I'm going with the seven. And like, that's the end of it. And people make some big, big mistakes financially. They end up regretting big time having that you know, narrow focus. So if you're a first time home buyer, why is having a mortgage strategy so crucial? Yeah, I think especially as a first time home buyer, Gary, that they're just looking at home as a place to lay their head at night and then move on, right? So we need a place to put our head at night. But for most young adults, which are your first time home buyers, they have been living with family majority of their lives and maybe a couple years in an apartment or a rental home or something like that. So they don't really think of the long term because 
they they don't really equate the financial aspect of buying a home with the home purchase prospect. And it's it's a long term commitment. That's the big issue is it's a long term commitment. And when a first time home buyer looks at the process and the prospect of owning a home, they're not thinking of it as a, a long term commitment or they're I shouldn't say that they're not projecting out to themselves. What does this home look like in mm-hmm. 10 years? Am I even going to own it in 10 years? And one of the things that I really try to hone in on with all my clients, especially the the younger home buyers is what's your trajectory here? Like, is this your forever home or is this a short term? Because I think the last I checked, the average time people live in a home is like five to seven years, right? So we can't look at it as, you know, something much, much longer. We also can't look at it as something where you're going to buy a home and move in a year because that's a losing a, a big losing proposition, right? The other thing is that the budget changes as a homeowner. Once you buy a home, your budget is completely different. So that's why having the mortgage strategy is crucial because you've got maintenance to think about. You've got repairs to think about. As a renter or living under your parents' roof, you didn't have to worry about any of that, right? That's got to be part of your budget. The upkeep, the utilities, there's new bills that are going to come into play. And I'm talking about outside of the mortgage that need to be factored in. If you don't have a mortgage strategy and if you don't know about all these factors in your budget as a homeowner, it's going to lead to financial disaster. And the last thing that I'll mention on this, Gary, is the equity considerations. If you put a low down payment, it's going to handcuff you to the home, mm-hmm. meaning if you put no money down or a minimal 3.5% down payment and you get a job transfer in a year or two, right, and you need to sell that home, you may not have the ability at all to sell that home. You haven't had the time to establish equity in that property. And there's costs to buying and selling homes. Selling the biggest cost is the realtor commission. So if you don't have a tenure equity built up in that home, you're going to be, again, handcuffed to the property. So putting a bigger down payment or having more financial flexibility with the home purchase can help you in that long run. To well, I think having it. more skin in the game is 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 key because you have you have equity, you have something at stake. Yeah. You, know? um, you had mentioned about different types of residential mortgages mm-hmm. that are offered uh, right now. Discuss some of the outlets you know that someone can can get as well. Like the pros and the cons as well with each right. of these. Yeah, so let's start by talking about the banks and the credit unions because they're everywhere, you know, all over the place. And I would say the biggest con is that they're not mortgage specialists. You cannot show me a bank or credit union that is a specialist in mortgages. Like that's what they do and that's their specialty. They're really good at checking accounts, savings accounts. A lot of them are good at auto loans and personal loans. Um, They have their specialties, right? Mortgage is just not one of them. So it's much like finding a surgeon or someone that's going to be doing complex medical work. Are you going to go to the specialist that that's exactly what they do and have decades of experience? Or are you going to go to the generalist that, yeah, they do that, but they do some other stuff too? Um, You really have to look at this like you're getting financial surgery because really this is the closest thing to that that you're going to get with your money. So I would say that the the pros to working with a bank or credit union is that occasionally I will see a bank or a credit union that has a niche product. Niche meaning it's very specific and focused. And the one that comes to mind is a doctor loan. You know, doctor loans is a very specific niche product we see in the mortgage industry. And I have seen banks and credit unions in different areas throughout the entire country that it's a specialty product and they really just thrive with it. You know, Mm -hmm. and they're well known that this is their specialty, right? So you might be lucky enough to be a doctor and have a relationship with a credit union that specializes in doctor loans. And that's, you know, it's rare, but if that happens, like, you know, run with it. So that's something we need to look at, not only the cons, but also that potential pro there. Also, HELOCs sometimes are great for credit unions and banks. Um, They have some some of those specific in-house products. When we move to the next rung on the ladder, it's going to be talking about like a mortgage banker and a correspondent lender. All right. Mm. So this is a bank that does specialize in mortgages. Generally, you're not going to see them with, you know, a uh, brick and mortar location that you're going to go into, um, but they do have a local presence. So 
this is a, a, a type of scenario where a mortgage banker has a lot of control over their process. They have in-house underwriting. So you're going to get a smooth process generally uh, with a mortgage banker, smoother than you might with a bank uh, or a, even a mortgage broker because, again, it's in-house. There's a lot of control. They also have a pretty good product mix, a lot of different options of different products. Um, but the con that I'll say with a mortgage banker is that – a lot of the time, they're not able to broker a loan out if they need to. So if there's something that's outside of the box, you may be told no. Um, so that's definitely a big con there. And then overlays. A lot of these mortgage bankers have overlays, which in industry speak, what that means is like they have extra guidelines. So yeah, you might be able to get your mortgage approved through FHA, but the mortgage banker that you're dealing with has an overlay that says, no, we won't go down to that low of a credit <laughs> score. The uh, credit score is probably the biggest one. You know, FHA may grant a loan to a lower credit score, but a bank may say to you, no, we won't do that loan below a, a 620, for example. The last one's going to be mortgage broker. Okay. Mortgage broker has the best product mix. And the pros there is you're going to get access to pretty much every product out there. Sharp pricing, you know, pretty much the best rates in the industry when you're dealing with a mortgage broker because we can shop around and lower margins because generally a mortgage broker is going to be a one man show or a very, very small operation. They don't have big margins. They don't have a huge building to pay rent and all these other expenses like these other things do. So lower margins, which means lower cost to you. But the con is that you do give up a little bit of control in the process. Because you don't have all this extra staff, you're th using third parties, using other banks to do the underwriting and things like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that might mean a little bit of a longer time. When I mean a little longer time, I'm talking about an extra day, couple days, not mm -hmm. many weeks. So it's usually worth that extra one or two or a couple days to get that sharper pricing and that better processing. Folks, you are listening to Mortgage Matters Radio Show in the Connecticut Real Estate Edge podcast along with Rob Weinberg. I'm Gary Byron. He's very easy to reach. You can head online to his website, which is robgw.com. You can also write down his phone number and make sure you give him a call, 860-413-3938. I'll repeat both of those, and I'll toss in a free email address more towards the end of the show. All right, Rob, what are some methods that uh, I, I can an individual use in order to evaluate a mortgage besides just searching for the lowest interest rate on the Internet? Right. So I would say the biggest method to start with in vetting out a loan officer and mortgage officer is going to be the recommendations and reviews. That, to me, is going to mean way more you know, than the lowest rate any day for sure. Uh, so I would start there with the referrals and the reviews. And the referrals is getting a recommendation from somebody that you know. Sometimes it can be a realtor. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can be a friend. Sometimes it can be a family member that maybe just bought a home recently or has experience there. And get the names of either one or a couple individuals that then you can plug that info in online and vet that, right? So you might start out with three, four, five names, but let's narrow that down to one or two and, and go from there. The other thing is online presence and social media. So in today's day and age, anybody who's anybody in the real estate and mortgage world has some sort of online presence. That might mean a website, a review site, a Zillow site, realtor, something where you can really say this person has a social media presence. They're a trusted authority. If somebody in 2023 does not have anything online and you're Googling them and can't find recommendations, reviews, websites, testimonials, all that stuff, then you might want to move on and find somebody that does. Because to me, that's a big thing. It's not difficult to do. It doesn't take a lot of effort to get a website going or reviews going and that sort of thing. So it just shows you a little bit about maybe their uh, experience and thoroughness in their business if they don't have that. The last thing I'll say is a unique plan and strategy. So when you get beyond all the fees and the rates and all that, there's a plan that everybody's got for where this mortgage fits in, right? Where this home fits in. Sometimes you will find somebody that gives you a very unique perspective or a unique plan that you haven't heard from somebody else. And that sometimes can be a reason to latch on and work with that person because it's so unique. I'm intrigued, Rob. Why do you feel it's so important to talk about mortgage mistakes? Yeah, the reason, Gary, is going to be the financial impact. These mortgage mistakes, just making one of these 
can have a huge financial impact. When I say huge, I'm talking about, you know, on the low end, tens of thousands of dollars. On the high end, hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's a saying that we have in the mortgage world, which is do it right or do it twice. Because if you screw up your loan origination, it's not just a return on Amazon or clicking a button to get a refund. It is a complete unwinding and restructuring of your mortgage, which has additional costs, fees, and risks and stress associated with it. So if you don't do it right and you don't heed what we're discussing, take these ideas to heart and how you're not going to make these mistakes, then you may end up being one of the people that either has great regret about how they handled the mortgage process or does end up having to do it twice and spend more money than you needed to. All right. Well, what about new real estate investors? What mistakes do you see them making often? Yeah, this is common nowadays because what we've seen is the rent's going up so much, the price is going up so much, a lot of greed is coming into the real estate market. And you see young investors, and I say young because, you know, a lot of them are less than 30. That to me is young. Mm -hmm. They're buying their second, third, fourth property, and they're looking at it going, okay, the mortgage is going to be three grand a month and the rent's going to be 3500 a month. Okay, I'm good. And they stop there, right? And that's it. But just evaluating a deal based on the gross rent is one of the most amateur mistakes that a real estate investor can make. There's insurance. There's- well, there's so many things that you can get. And when you're, when you're getting into a property, the easy ones we can say is mortgage, tax, and insurance, right? Yeah. Those are the easy ones everyone knows. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, as they say, because below that you've got maintenance, repairs, potential utilities. You've got all this stuff that needs to be and will have cost either up front or over the life of you owning the property. And a lot of early investors, a lot of people that just look at those gross rents, they get in over their head because the inspection, maybe they don't do one or they ignore it. And all of a sudden they've got big repairs that need to be made. All of a sudden they've got tenants that maybe aren't as reliable as they thought they would be. And they just come into financial turmoil very, very quickly. So just looking at the gross rents, is a big thing, um, not considering the maintenance of the property as well as the holding costs of the property. So having a property that's vacant in the winter in Connecticut has a, a large holding cost to it. And a lot of early investors, new investors, they don't think about that, right? So they don't think about what if that property's vacant in December, January, and February. What is that going to mean to me from a financial standpoint? There's a lot of upkeep, right? There's maintenance. There's utilities that need to be paid. And if there's no tenant in there, it's your responsibility. Uh, So that's a big one. And then the last one I'll say for big mistakes is overestimating the market and not being realistic. There's a saying in the investing world that says past performance does not guarantee future results. And that can be said for real estate too. The past performance real estate over the last year or two has been phenomenal. It's been the standout winner in all asset classes. That doesn't mean that it's going to be that Mm -hmm. next year, though. And it looks like it's tapering down. So don't make those financial decisions based on what you hope and what the past was. Be realistic for the future. When it comes to refinancing, can you discuss maybe a few common mistakes that you see that could be improved upon? Yeah. So a lot of the time, especially nowadays, Gary, when people need to refinance, they're not refinancing in today's market for a lower rate. That Those have gone by the wayside. So the reason I'm mentioning that today is because people are refinancing because of a financial need, which ends up being an emotional need. Uh-huh. So a lot of the time that is I need money for XYZ and the home is where I can get that money. The cash out refi, the new mortgage is where I can get that money, right? So they've got an emotional attachment to getting that money. It could mean saving money. It can mean a medical uh, emergency that's handled. It could mean helping a family member that's in need, right? So there's emotions tied to that. Unfortunately, because of that, I'm seeing a lot of homeowners right now making rash decisions when it comes to refinancing, making the wrong decision. And what I mean is, They're taking the first proposal they get. So they're looking at refinancing. They know the rates are higher. But rather than maybe talk to a couple experts and just take their time making a decision, they get a proposal and it looks good. And they say, "Eh, let's go with it and take that first one. They could have saved, though, a lot of money, maybe getting a second opinion, right? Maybe getting somebody to shop around with different banks and see what other options they have. But at the very least, even if it's not saving money, at least getting a second set of eyes 
at your idea to see, hey, maybe here's a n- different way that you could handle this. So that's a big, big no-no and a big mistake that I'm seeing right now. Um, the second one is not taking advantage of a higher value. So because we've seen such a large run-up in home prices over the last 12 to 24 months, Mm -hmm. we have a huge amount, a record amount of equity that's in people's homes. Yet I still see people being timid sometimes with it because a lot of our parents and grandparents pass this thing down that you don't want to have a big mortgage, right? Get rid of that thing. So people are still scared to tap their home equity. And I see a big mistake as not taking full advantage of the higher value of your home, not tapping maybe as much equity as you could. Because what I'm seeing now with the way the economy is, the way the market is, the way inflation has taken hold of us, we're finding that three to six months after taking equity out of your home, people go, darn, I wish I would have gotten more money for this. Darn, now I need 10 grand for this and I should have done it then and I didn't. So Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that people should borrow more money than they need. What I am saying and what I am doing with all my clients now is a very, very thorough fact find for the next 12 to 24 months. What do you have going on that might be a cash flow need? Do you have kids going away to school? Do you have parents maybe that need to transition to nursing homes, assisted living, whatnot? Where are you going to be a financial need? Where is people going to be coming to you? Maybe you have the kids going away to school. Like there's all this stuff that we can factor in. So I that's thought about that. Yeah. That's big in taking advantage of the value because we don't know how long the values are going to stay no, high. True. Right, but right. what we do know is Connecticut has had a volatile market. We've seen some times where those values have been way down and that's the time when you need the money most, right? So the next thing is having a realistic plan for the future. If you know you're going to sell your home in six months, why would you refinance your home? There's really no, not a wouldn't. good reason. Right, no. But but again, people are making emotional decisions, and there are people that are refinancing that will sell their home in the next three to six months. Why? It doesn't make sense. Maybe it's a weird need. But again, having a realistic plan for the future is a big thing. And take into account future unknowns. You know, you want to know that there's going to be problems. There's going to be hurdles ahead. Don't be naive and use your mortgage to plan with that. Don't take and max out your budget to try to pay your home off early because I've seen clients do that and end up in huge credit card debt years later. So where's the right move? All right, folks, you've been listening to Mortgage Matters Radio Show and the Connecticut Real Estate Edge podcast. If you'd like more information on this show and any other that we do, uh, simply head on over to Rob's website, which is robgw.com. If you'd like to uh, ask him a question, maybe submit an email. That's easy to do as well. Simply email Mortgage Matters Radio Show at gmail.com. And if you'd like to schedule a consultation, write this phone number down, 860 413 39 I'll repeat that for you again. 860-413-3938. For Rob Weinberg, I'm Gary Byron. Thank you so much for listening to Mortgage Matters Radio Show and the Connecticut Real Estate Edge Podcast. Until next Saturday morning, have a good one, everybody. So long.